You have built two Fortune 500 companies yourself and started a third that I hadn't even been aware that, that was your responsibility, it was Cablevision, um, that went off <laughs> and became another Fortune 500 company. So one of the great entrepreneurs of, of, um, of the last 50 years. Now, if you were starting out today as an entrepreneur, how would America look to you as a, as a, as a country? It will, look at, it will look like a country of great opportunity, especially in fields of technology, scientific and medical research, whether it's genomics, stem cell research, uh, and so on. And do you feel that the environment for an entrepreneur is significantly different from when you were starting out? Is it easier, is it harder? Well, I, I think it's actually easier if you look at all the things, all the great startups we've had in garages and so on, and how quickly they've, uh, uh, matured and how wealthy people have become. It's, I think it's a lot easier today. And do you feel that uh, there's this current mood about the American economy, I guess the, the economy of, of many developed countries that is, you know, is very gloomy, you know, a lot of concern about the, the future. Um, do you, are you an optimist? Are you a pessimist? How, how do you feel about the world? I'm a long-term optimist. Sure, we've got a lot of things to concern ourselves about. We've got to concern ourselves with what's going to happen in the Eurozone. We've got to concern ourselves with the uh, poor state of American education and how we end up with a more competitive uh, workforce and lots of other things. Now, do you feel that the current administration is doing a good job in addressing uh, those I think challenges? they're doing a good job in several areas. In education reform, for example, I believe the President and Secretary Duncan are doing a great job in moving the ball forward to trying to reform American education. It's, it's, K through 12 is really a broken system that needs to be reformed. Uh, we, we could look at foreign policy and some of us have different views on how that's going. Uh, on economic policy, uh, I think uh, I wish the administration uh, would create greater confidence on a part of large corporations in Wall Street. How would you do that? What do, what do you think they need to do to generate more confidence? Well, I think they're going to have to start stop talking about uh, what caused all the problems in 07, 08, 09, and so on, and move forward and really embrace uh, uh, American business. What does embracing American business mean? It means less regulations. It means using the bully pulpit to talk about the fact that private enterprise has really made this country great and is going to be less reliant on government in the future. Now, you mentioned education. Um, and I, one of the things that struck me in general in your book as to how you talk about your philanthropy is that you do bring this same hard-headed approach to, to dealing with the um, you know, non-profit sector and so forth that you deploy in um, the deployed in business now in education you have uh, you know, really sponsored a number of initiatives including here in New York to try and change the way that system works and I mean, and yet I mean I think most observe, most neutral observers would say change has been rather painfully slow that you and other philanthropists have been banging your heads against a, a brick wall do you feel that's the case it's been slow. We've been at it for 12 years, and I wish we uh, in America have made greater progress. But I see a lot of good things happening. I see a lot of young governors and mayors more involved than ever. I see parts of the Democratic Party are no longer aligned with the teachers' unions. I see uh, a move toward what I call blended learning, where you use technology, the best of technology, with the best of teachers working together uh, to change things. I see the need. Uh, for a longer school day and a longer school year, similar to what they have in other countries. There are lots of things happening, and I think we may be close to some tipping point for change in K-12 education. And do you think that um, you know, what the, the, the methods that work in the business world you know, can be applied in, in something like the education system? I, I clearly do. 
we need competition between regular public schools, public charter schools, and other schools, which we've not had. And that's starting to happen across America. And how do you interpret um, the recent strike in, in Chicago, where that, that seemed to me a very important moment in the Democratic Party sort of wrestling with the school reform because you had someone like Rahm Emanuel who's so closely associated with President Obama falling out with the teachers union so spectacularly. Well, Rahm didn't get all the things he should have gotten. He got, a, he got a, 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 and, uh, in evaluating teachers, 30% are going to be based upon student performance, which is, is new. He got a longer school day. He did not get a lot of other things. I thought the timing of the negotiation strike was very unfortunate coming just six, seven weeks before the election. So you felt he couldn't have pushed as hard as he might have done because he didn't want to embarrass President Obama? Or? Uh, that may have been so. Um, so what do you think is, is the greatest progress that's been made on school reform so far? I think one, the uh, charter schools. I think if we go back like 20 years, we have one charter school in America. I think we now have something like five, six million children in charter schools, and they're paving the way. The results of good charter schools, whether it's Kip Academy in New York City, Uncommon Schools, uh, Success Academy here, show that you can educate all kids, and you can have 90% plus graduation, and a high percentage of those going off to college. Now, some people, you know, including, I mean, I suppose most prominently Diane Ravitch have, have sort of <laughs> accused you and Bill Gates and others of being part of a billionaire boys club that's trying to take over the education system on behalf of corporate America. I mean, how, how do you react to that kind of well, I'm not. Well, let me just say I'm not a fan of Diane Ravitch. I've met with her a number of times. Uh, she flip-flopped. She was in a very different place a number of years ago, and all of a sudden she became the darling of the teachers' unions. And do you, I mean, do you feel ultimately it does come down to the unions? Are they the biggest obstacle to... No, you've got a broken system. You've got bad governance. You have 14,000 school boards made up of political wannabes, well-meaning parents, people representing labor organizations, competing with national education ministries. So we've got to have a greater role on the part of governors, big city mayors. Uh, 47 governors have agreed to something called Common Core, which is important. What's and I that? think, well, it's the same core curriculum in science and math throughout America. Before that, you had some states that had one year of math or one year of science, and other states had two or three years. So we, we, we're, we're one nation. We're not competing against each other state by state. We're competing against other nations. And we need a greater role, in my view, in, in the US Department of Education. If you look at what's changed in America, it was no child left behind, which was not perfect but it, added, it created accountability and measurement. You had the race to the top, which caused about 30 some odd states to change their laws uh, to allow charter schools and other reforms to take place. Now you've also been very active in the arts, not least in you know, being one of the people transforming downtown Los Angeles into a much more uh, well, habitable place and enjoyable place to visit. <laughs> Um, but uh, again, you write in the book a lot about the difficulties with boards of non-profit institutions like art museums, and you've obviously been in the news recently, a lot of people resigning and protests at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Arts in Los Angeles, and you delaying your grants and so forth. And what's, what, what is that situation now resolved? And what, what, and what underlying, what, what lessons do you take out well, as a philanthropist? Some museum boards, including Museum of Contemporary Art, have a lot of people that have never served on any governing body before. And the problem they had there is we had a new director, which we recruited to increase attendance, serve a diverse audience, and some of the older trustees were not comfortable with that. And so how was it resolved? It's being resolved. I think things have quieted down. We're recruiting new trustees and doing a number of other things at the Museum of Contemporary Art. But if you were advising someone today you know, who'd been successful in business, who was moving into 
you know, scaling up their non-profit activity, their philanthropic activity, they want to really be impactful as a donor. I mean, what, what, what advice would you give them if they... You know, well, the areas I'd, I'd point them to is K-12 education. I think that's the biggest problem we have in America. Uh, I'd also point to scientific and medical research. As you know, we've got the Broad Institute in Genomics, partners with Harvard and MIT. We're involved in stem cell research at three California universities. But in terms of, I guess, how you make that transition from being an effective business person, I mean, how, what, what are the challenges of leadership in the nonprofit world compared to well, the business world? When we, when we, we don't give money away, we invest it and we look for return. In education, it's improved student achievement. It's closing the gap between income and ethnic groups. In scientific and medical research, it's, it's advancement, in, uh, whether it's in genomics or stem cell research, to improve the human condition. But do you think you can be as unreasonable as a person, as a leader, as a manager in that world, and, and be effective, or do you need a different style, personal style? Well, you, you need, sometimes you need a different personal style. Characterize that for me. Well, you know, if you're CEO, if you're CEO of a Fortune 500 company, uh, uh, you're not quite a dictator, but you're pretty close to one. You get your way and so on. You convince your board and you move on. When you're in the nonprofit sector, whether it's uh, whether it's in education or science or, or especially the arts, uh, you've got to deal with a very diverse group of pe people, and you have to uh, uh, have a lot more patience. Uh, uh, Patience is uh, not always a virtue. <laughs> As I, thought, I loved one of your comments in, in the book about how, I mean, essentially, you don't like to spend more than three hours doing absolutely anything, and you'll you, know, you keep your meetings as short as possible. And I have a horrible feeling you'll keep this interview as short as possible. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the, the, this sort of, I mean, I, I, I sat through a, a global fund dinner earlier this week where they had 45 different speakers, it seemed like that many, all saying exactly the same thing. And I, I thought of you at that moment. <laughs> I wonder whether I could leave as quickly as you would have left. But um, the whole, I mean, this, this, this approach um, in, um, in life, I mean, you get your eight hours sleep a night, which is I extraordinary. Do. Most of the time. And have you, I mean, do you believe that to be like a very, I think we should, is this one of the lessons for today's world that you should be getting eight hours sleep a night? Well, everyone has a different need for sleep. I happen to need eight hours. I see others that get by with four or five hours and do very well with that. But so it's, you don't think it's a, it's not a tip that you would give everybody, no? No, no, every, everyone's different in their sleep needs. So um, <laughs> the, uh, the work you've done in, um, in stem cell research and, and the human genome, I guess there's been a, a sort of sense of, a slight sense of disappointment that the breakthroughs have happened, but yet we don't seem to have found that it's, it's filtered through to, to real life-changing therapies, lot, products, etc. There's a lot of impatience. People want results overnight, and in, in whether it's genomics or stem cell research, we're starting to see all sorts of good things happening, but the best is yet to come. When do you think it will really start to impact on most people's lives? Next several years. You mean within a decade or? Less than a decade. And where do you expect the first most interesting, the first breakthroughs to be? Well, look at all the things happening in, uh, in cancer research and the Cancer Genome Project, which we're involved in. In stem cell research, uh, a number of good things are happening with regard to Parkinson's and other, other diseases. So you think we can make real inroad against cancer over the next few years? Oh, I, no question about that. It's happening. Now, um, in the arts, what are the, what are the trends? That, what, who are the artists that most excite you at the moment? And are there particular trends that we should be looking out for? Well, what we're doing at Art Foundation is... Uh, we built a lending library of contemporary art, and we've made 8,000 loans to 450 institutions in the last 27 years. So we think art serves a great purpose. It, create, it, helps, create, it helps creativity and so on. So our purpose is to have a broader audience interested in contemporary art design because we think it'll stimulate creativity amongst the, uh, a lot more people. I remember talking to Bill Gates and him saying 
oh, I'm not going to give money to opera houses. And he seemed very dismissive of, of philanthropy that was going into the arts. I mean, do you see it as a, I mean, you obviously see it as a useful thing to put your money into, but what, mm -hmm. what is it that, that you feel supporting the arts can do for a society? Well, I, I think, it, yeah. when I think it's great for our economy, uh, I think the cultural tourism, uh, whether it's in Los Angeles or New York, is very important. I think it helps uh, people become more creative. Uh, they look at things and there's always a shock of the new and uh, they think about it and learn from it. And I mean, do you feel America does enough on the arts or is there? No, we don't do enough on the arts compared with European nations and certain Asian nations. So where would you like to see most focus? I'd like to see more focused on supporting our great art institutions, in addition to what we have to do in education, K through 12 and higher ed. Now, earlier on um, this morning, I spoke to uh, Ellen Goldman, who runs uh, DuPont, and mm -hmm. asked her this question that is obviously a debate that's taking place amongst a lot of women as to whether they can have it all, whether they can have a successful professional career and a successful family life. And I was very struck in your book, in your reflections at the end, that you talked about how you'd had a successful professional career, a successful philanthropic career, a great marriage, but you felt you neglected your uh, relationship with your Look, sons to some extent. I mean, how do you, how do you, what, what, what would you advise well, someone in the, now in the, er about? in the early years, you know, it was 24 seven as they say, and, uh, if I had to do it over again, I'd probably uh, spend more time with my boys when they were growing up. And so I, think pay, I paid a price for our success. And do you think that was a price worth paying? Well, you can't look back. I always look forward. If I had to do it over again, I'd do it somewhat differently. So what advice would you give to people starting out now? Uh, well, if they're starting out, it's 24-7, it's and uh, you're going to have to make sacrifices if you want to succeed. So men can't have it all. Either. And everyone has to make their own choices about uh, whether you're willing to uh, put in the energy and time to make things really happen, or if they want to have a more comfortable, balanced life, uh, that's a choice they can make. But they will not be as successful is someone that's driven. So ultimately, it really does come down to, you know, if we want to, if you, if you really want to be successful, you have to basically sacrifice a normal life in some ways. Yeah, to, for a while, certainly when you're starting. And do you, and do you think there's nothing we can really do to change how society works, how business works, to make that less of a price to pay? I'm sure we can. I'm not sure how. Some European nations have done a better job at that than we have. Although I guess you would look at Europe and say that may have resulted <laughs> in a uh, uh, sort of par you know, breakdown. Well, if you look at the French and Italians, you have one view. If you look at Germany, there's another view. Um, what is it about America that, for you, has made it such a, a, an effective place for entrepreneurs? I think there's great opportunity here. America's a meritocracy. The uh, city I live in, Los Angeles, is a great meritocracy. I came there without the right politics, the right religion, uh, the right social background, and so on. And if you're willing to work hard and have great ideas, you're accepted. That's true almost throughout everywhere in America. See, now that belief is increasingly you know, challenged by academics who look at data and say there's less mobility and uh, in the political debate at the moment, I mean, this notion that America's still got this ability, the American dream is still in, in good shape. I mean, that is being questioned. I mean, do you think it's still as lively as ever? I, I, I think the American dream is still there for those that have the education and are willing to work and find, find that dream. And so the one thing we need to do is to fix the education system. And That's the biggest problem we have, K through 12 education. Uh, we've got millions of jobs in America that can't, cannot be filled because we don't have a skilled workforce. The Council of Foreign Relations came out with a report saying that education is a national security issue and that 70% of 18 to 24-year-olds are not fit to serve in the military today for education and other reasons. So we've got a big job to do to fix a broken system of education. And if 
you had a wish list for the one thing you would like to see change quickly in the education system over the next 12 months? I mean, what would that one thing be? Well, I don't know about 12 months, but I'd love to see us go to blended learning, which is taking the best of technology and the best of teachers and having them work together. The American classroom hasn't changed in 150 years. And you think now's the moment to change it? It is, and it's starting to change in a number of places across America. Well, Eli Bright, I'd thank you very much for, for coming to join us this morning. It's been very uh, inspiring to hear your comments, and I do uh, thoroughly uh, recommend your book, The Art of Being Unreasonable. I, I, I think it is the best thing I've read on entrepreneurship in a very long time. You're so very thank nice. Thank you very much. Good to be with Great. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.